Welcome to SciLight, the science highlight show which gives you a rundown of some of the coolest science in the world right now. I am Julia Ravy and I am nearing the end of my PhD in neuroscience. Just got the little fact of having to write, you know, an entire thesis first, but let's move on from that to some science in the news this week. My first report is that the Earth has reportedly lost about 9% of its insects each decade for the past 30 years. Insects are extremely important for many of the Earth's ecosystems. And a recent review compiled data from 166 different long-term studies across the world looking at insect numbers. These studies were from over a thousand different sites and were measuring insect numbers from the year 1925 all the way up to 2018. The review found that on average we are losing around 0.92% of our land-based insects every year and it appeared that this trend was mainly driven by sites in North America and Europe. In fact, if you took the North American data sets out of this analysis, the 0.92% number dropped to 0.45%. So this tells us that the insect numbers in different regions can be driving this overall decrease. In some better news, the study did report that the number of freshwater insects is going up. And this has been reported by about 11% each decade. In terms of actual numbers, freshwater insects represent far fewer bodies than land-based terrestrial insects because freshwater only covers about 2.4% of the world's surface. But the results show that these numbers started to increase from about the year 2000 in North America, Asia and Europe. The researchers suggested that these increases could be due to cleaner water. Also, the report found there appears to be weaker trends in declining insect numbers in areas that are protected. And this suggests that we can actually alter the numbers of these insects. The researchers did point out that there was large variation between the different sites that were monitored in terms of insect number. And this was even found in sites that are neighbors to each other. So the numbers of 9%, 11% may not be exactly right. Also, the majority of the sites monitored were in North America, or Europe. So we're not really getting a full global picture of these insect numbers. Even so, the trend reported from over 150 studies here does suggest that these numbers are declining. And this could really impact our ecosystems and also other species that rely on eating these insects to stay alive. But it looks like we can potentially change this by protecting habitats because we gotta look after our insects. My second science story of the week is that mice that have sight loss can have some of their visual impairments improved by being treated with skin cells. What? Yes, you did hear that right. A research group managed to aid the visual impairment of a mouse model with sight loss using cells derived from skin. With many diseases that affect the retina, which is in your eye, the final stage of sight loss is the loss of these cells which can detect light. These are called photoreceptors and their loss leads to irreversible blindness. Researchers were able to generate photoreceptor-like cells from human adult skin cells and they did this by adding five specific factors. These generated cells were found to look like photoreceptors in living beings and this was monitored by looking at the proteins that these cells expressed. But to really test if these cells could be like the real deal, researchers implanted them into a mouse model which has sight loss. And this was with the aim to see if these cells could improve the visual impairments that these mice have. 43% of the mice which had these cells transplanted into them showed improvements to their pupil response, and that is dilation and contraction. This indicates that the eye can detect light and so has working photoreceptors. And one of these mice also showed improvements in visual acuity and contrast sensitivity. So this suggests that these new cells can work in a very similar way to photoreceptors in the eye. When looking at the mice which showed improvements to their pupil response, the cells in these mice show connections to other cells in the eye. These mice were also found to have a higher number of surviving cells three months after the transplant surgery. So a big question here is why did the transplant work in some mice and why didn't it work in others? This is something that is beyond the scope of the study, but will be something which is really important to answer if these cells are wanting to be used in humans and as a therapy for sight loss. It's also unclear how long these results last for. Is this a permanent thing? 
Does sight get better by having these in or is sight stunted at the point of where it's already degenerated to? So it will be really important to monitor these mice much further down the line to see if their visual improvements are still there. Also, limitation as always, the study was done in mice and not people, but it does have some really cool therapeutic implications and could open up a whole new therapy for people who have progressive sight loss. My final cool science story this week was that now we have a full map of the moon. Have you ever wondered what those bumps and craters are that you can see on the moon? This new map can tell you. The USGS, NASA and the Lunar Planetary Institute mapped the entire surface of the moon and classified all of these surfaces to tell us more about the moon's geology. This map is online and has a scale of one to five million. So it is super detailed. This map was created using regional maps from the Apollo missions and also from satellite images. It's important that we understand the moon's geology to help us with future space missions. But now you can fly to the moon from the comfort of your own home. My satellite this week is talking about some really interesting research on how our births could impact our microbial inhabitants. We have a whole universe of tiny organisms living in us and on us. These organisms are called microbes and include species like bacteria. And their collective inhabitants of your body is called your microbiome. Microbes are critical to human health. You hear the word bacteria and normally think, ugh, gross, don't like bacteria. But these living organisms that colonize us are vital in protecting us from invaders, in breaking down our food, and now they've even been implicated in our mental health. Each one of us has a different makeup of microbes. Some of these are good and healthy, whereas others can be bad for our health. The majority of our microbes are found in our guts. And other areas microbes occupy are our skin, in our mouths, and for females, they occupy the birthing canal. As a baby, you are thought to be devoid of microbes until you are birthed. It is thought that the microbes you are exposed to very early on in life are vital in training up your immune system. These sit in the gut and can tell your immune system when something good or something bad enters the body. These microbes can be affected by various events, including antibiotic exposure, breastfeeding and birthing method. Birthing methods over the years have changed dramatically and the introduction of the C-section has made birth much, much safer. But it's unclear what impact this birthing method has on the first microbes a baby is exposed to. Being birthed vaginally, a baby is exposed to the mother's microbes on their way into the world. And these organisms go on to live inside the baby's gut. But a C-section birth eliminates this form of microbial exposure. And researchers have found that babies delivered in this way have a very different microbiome in the early stages of their life compared to vaginally born babies. Babies. Research published in autumn last year looked at faecal samples from 596 babies which were collected just after birth and up to a year following birth. From these samples, researchers extracted DNA and this can tell them what microbial species could be present in the baby's guts. In these early samples which were collected, 68.25% of the microbes found in the C-section baby guts were from the surrounding hospital environment. And this was compared to less than a quarter in vaginally delivered babies. Babies born via C-section also only had 0.43% of their entire microbiome made up of a species called bacteroids. And in vaginally delivered babies, these made up about 51% of their gut microbiome. It's important to note as well that vaginally delivered babies whose mothers have been on antibiotics also had lower levels of these bacteroids. And this is because antibiotics kill bacteria, both good and bad. Of all the babies monitored, 83.7% of those delivered via C-section were found to contain an opportunistic pathogen. And these are microbes which can go on to cause infection. Whereas in vaginally delivered babies, these pathogens were only found in less than half. The levels of these hospital bugs in C-section babies did lessen with age. So when they got to infancy, the levels of these hospital bugs were at a similar level to the levels in vaginal babies. So what does all this mean? Well, those early months of life are thought to be crucial in setting up your immune system. And the microbes you have in there are like the personal trainers. It's not quite clear how having hospital microbes over mother's microbes makes a difference to this training, but long-term studies are needed to look into how these different microbes play a role 
in impacting the immune system in different birthing methods. If we do find out that this is important, can we do anything about it? C-sections are vital for healthy deliveries of at-risk mothers and babies. So in order to give the mother's microbes to the child in this scenario, one suggestion is to coat the baby in vaginal microbes as soon as it is delivered. And this should hopefully allow their colonization. Silite of the week, done. My science clickbait headline this week is one of my favourite types of science clickbait headlines. This week, the clickbait headline is Filter coffee is good for you. Study shows that people who drink up to four cups a day are 15% less likely to die from a heart attack. A nice old correlation study. We love them. So I dug into the actual research that this article was based on and found the hypothesis for the study was around the cholesterol level in unfiltered coffee. So there are higher levels of low density lipoprotein cholesterols in unfiltered coffee. So it's thought that filtering these out could be more beneficial to one's health. The study analysed the coffee drinking habits of half a million people over a 20 year period. The study asked what amount and what type of coffee these people drank. They asked for their height and weight, smoking habits, blood pressure and years of formal education. Also they asked if participants did more than one hour of vigorous activity per week. And over the course of the 20 year period, over 46,000 of these individuals died. And they found of the people who died that there were less people who drank coffee. And of these coffee consumers, there was a lower number of people who drank filtered coffee over unfiltered coffee. And this was also the case when the researchers looked at diseases related to the heart. Of the coffee consumers, those who drank between one to four cups of filtered coffee per day had a lower mortality rate, so were less likely to die. And those who drank over nine cups of unfiltered coffee had the highest mortality rate. So together the study concluded that if you drink filtered coffee, you are less likely to die of a heart attack. So this link looks quite nice, doesn't it? That drinking filtered coffee decreases your chances of dying from a heart-related disease. Not quite. Because this is a correlation study, all we have here is a link. There are so many questions that we need to answer to prove that this is true. And also there are so many questions that the researchers need to answer in this paper to give this link more strength. The relationships reported in this study could be swayed by one particular group. Also the measurements of coffee per day went from one cup, one to four cups, five to eight cups, or nine or more cups. The two cups of filtered coffee a day work just as good as four cups of filtered coffee a day. Also, what size are these cups? That's something the researchers didn't ask. My cup of coffee would be this size. Other people could drink coffee about this size. Also, how many shots of coffee were in each cup? Did people add milk? Did they add sugar? None of these things were addressed in the study. And all of these things could impact the likelihood of having a heart attack. Also, people could be abstaining from drinking coffee for other reasons like their mental health. And these conditions could alter someone's mortality. Also, the socioeconomic impact was not recognized in this study. And in terms of activity, they only considered if you did over one hour of vigorous activity a week. This is a very low bar for a yes or no answer. Again, Activity is one of the main things that can impact heart diseases and heart attacks. So this wasn't properly taken into account with these results. And finally, when I did my digging, I found that the lead author of the study had been a consultant for a coffee company in Norway where the study was conducted. Bias. You've always got to look at what the authors actually do and if any of them have conflicts of interest with the research. So the fact that the lead author has consulted this coffee company in the past could imply that he would want this to be a good result for filtered expensive coffee. Headlines like this drive me mad because there are so many more factors that go into someone having a heart attack than just drinking a certain type of coffee. And I think headlines like this can push people into more unhealthy practices. If you only drank four cups of filtered coffee a day, did no exercise, ate unhealthily, this could really sacrifice your health. I think it's important to note, you know, what type of coffee could aid your health, but in the whole picture of a healthy lifestyle. Finally, this is just a link. We really need to understand the science behind links to confirm if they are true. What aspect of filtered coffee could be driving down this rate of heart attacks? It might not necessarily be the cholesterol, 
but another chemical. Or it could be that there is another variable that comes along with drinking filtered coffee, maybe money, that is actually driving this trend. So it's really important to be hypercritical of correlation studies reported in the news. Thank you so much for watching Sciolites this week. If you're enjoying the content, please subscribe to the channel. And if you have any questions for me, you can catch me on my social media. And if you want to submit a paper to me, a newspaper article, or a clickbait headline, you can email me at this email address. Thank you so much, and I will see you for more science next week. Mm -hmm.